capitalism. I want to talk about this first. There's a long section in the identity chapter about the work of Gaston Gordillo, who uh, in, this, uh, in this section, he called it the breath of devils. In his, in his later book about it, he called it the landscape of devils. And uh, I didn't know quite what to do with this long section. Liz, tell us what happens here. Give us a, give us why, why, do, you, why do you like this part or what, what do you get out of it? Uh, they work on uh, sugar plantations and they're the world of land. Plantations of uh, forest slavery, there's growing conditions. And so the work of the Atlantic Blues is they believe that these plantations are holy mountains of prayer that they can use to do these things. Yeah, this is, I know, I mean, it is a pretty incredible story. You have people who were indigenous to this area. They are living by hunting and gathering. They basically got deprived of a lot of their way of life, displaced, basically forced to work on sugar plantations, not exactly forest, but pretty close, where they got the worst positions because of their ethnic identity. Uh, as uh, Liz has just described to us, this often resulted in disease and death, which they attributed to these to ideas of the devil. Um, Gordillo is here drawing upon some of the work. There's a lot of devil mythologies, especially in Latin America. Um, a lot of people have written about the association between the devil, wealth, capitalism. And so some people have argued that devil ideas are used by poor people to kind of resist capitalism. This seems to be more complicated in part because the devils come from uh, their, their homeland, although those are the devils they know, as they say. Um, and then uh, at the very end of this, uh, it, on page 243, it says that Gordillo commented that in his research, he was surprised to hear both positive and negative views of the plantations in the Patron. He argues that the devil imageries represent power rather than capitalism inscribed in a particular place. So, I mean, if, if there are any people in the world that you would think would be, have been totally screwed by capitalism and would be totally resistant to the idea of plantations, uh, this would certainly qualify. And they have these ideas also about uh, the cannibalism of not of, of people from the outside of wealthy people basically fueling the system by means of stealing them their their bodies and their their body fat. And this again is a common idea in, or it's a it's a recurring idea in places. Uh, throughout the world, this idea that people from the outside are coming in to steal their children, to steal their organs. Sometimes this actually happens, so it's not necessarily just a myth. Um, but uh, this idea that the capitalist system or the, the system of the wealthy is based upon a cannibalism of the poor. So it's a really, but it's a really complex association. As I said, there's there's both these positive associations with the plantation and making money and power and obviously some very negative associations with that. And so, uh, you know, I mean, I think when we talk about things like uh, when anthropologists try to recommend <laughs> things like flight path and participating in the global capitalist economy, we sometimes get a little bit ambivalent about that. And anthropology is probably the most ambivalent discipline about capitalism because we see what it's done in various places and what it's what has happened to various people as they are displaced and made to work in the global system. 
However, what happens, or I mean, what, what we can't deny is that in some ways, the idea that people should automatically resist capitalism as part of the working class has never really, I don't want to say never really worked, but it's had a difficult time. So on page 246, for example, where they give you a summary of anthropological theories of identity, and they talk about Marxism and identity, and there they cite Gordillo, it's that capitalism results in class identity being imposed, which, how to say? I mean, Marx believed that class identity was everything, and the working class would discover that they had these identities, and then they would become a class and sort of rise up and, and uh, resist the capitalist system. And as we know in this country, the identification of people as a working class person has been difficult to even think about. Many, many, many people in this country, regardless of their income, think of themselves as middle class, which is this huge span from people who are, who are definitely on the lower end of the scale to people who are way up higher than they should be. Um, but so the thing is, is that what happens here, and it's something that, again, they talk about at the end of the chapter, is trying to figure out uh, what identities are ascribed to us. So they might be imposed upon us. They might be uh, given to us. And what they call achieved identity, those identities that we try to, to choose or to uh, think about. So social class has been uh, one of those identities. And you can see that even among the Toba, like I said, if there were one group that you could say, wow, these guys, they got totally screwed over by the capitalist system. They should be resisting as a class. But even there, it doesn't seem to be necessarily uh, working out that they're identifying uh, as a social class. They have, as Gordillo says, both positive and negative connotations of working uh, in the plantations and of the power of the devil. And I guess it also has to do with people, uh, people have, have conceived of themselves not as necessarily as a class, but as an ethnic group or as a religious group rather than a social class. So this relates to an idea that we talked about before in the last class, which is, you know, how do we, what kinds of ideas, what kinds of identities take hold? How, how do people privilege certain identities? What kinds of identities are imposed upon others? And what kinds of identities do we get to choose? Uh, in, the class, in the classes after the, the second essay, we'll talk about gender. But I mean, gender is a great example here of something that traditionally in our own society, we have basically assigned gender to people. Right, we come out, somebody says you're this or that, and that's your ascribed identity. Uh, probably in the last, it's probably people have never quite felt comfortable with that, but certainly in the last 20 years or so, people have begun to question where that ascribed identity, that idea that you are what you are, is actually should be or could or should, should be the truth. Right, and so this is something that is starting to pass from being. A, an almost purely ascribed identity to one that is something that people have talked about as something that one might, one might change or alter or not feel entirely comfortable with, uh, both as an individual, but also uh, in society as well. So whenever we're thinking about identity, we have to think about, well, who has the power to impose? Who has the power to be able to choose? Uh, what difference does that make in terms of the groups that we have? Now, I'd like to go back here to the very beginning of the chapter and an idea, like I said, I wanted to talk about the idea of cultural relativism in terms of the idea of culture. So anthropologists, as we saw, came out with the idea that everybody becomes human because of culture, because of what we learn, because of our capacity for symbolic thought, because of the things that we are 
We are dependent on learning for our survival, that learning is how we become human. So that's the general principle of culture and anthropology is to emphasize the importance of learned behavior. But as a kind of research method or as a kind of idea, this became the idea that, oh, everyone has a particular culture. So it's not simply that culture is a process that makes us human, it's now that, oh, we all have a culture. And so when we do this thing called cultural relativism, we're assuming that there is one culture that we have, and there's another culture that's over there, and then there's another culture over here, and then everybody has one. And this translator, this, the, the, the follow-up to that is, does this mean that everyone has what we might call an ethnic identity? That their culture is part of what we might call an ethnicity, and so that we identify as that particular culture. And I think we're probably immediately struck by the idea, well then, uh, you know, well, what's, what's the culture of the United States then, right? What, what do we, is there, is, is the United States or another country simply an amalgam of an ethnic identity? And, and what, what is the, what then is the ethnic identity of say white people in the United States? Is that, I mean, they're the, sort of the classic unmarked people. So in some ways, anthropology started to investigate this idea though, because if everybody had a culture, that means we should be able to go out there and find these culture groups and draw boundaries around them. And so if you look on page 227 at the work of Friedrich Barth, what he did is he went out to a place, he was working actually in, uh, um, in, in I think it was in, in Pakistan, um, but he was looking at these uh, cultural groups that were very close to each other. And he started to kind of dispute the idea or to re-examine the idea that everybody had their own defined cultural group. And there were a number of points that he made about this. By the way, we're coming up uh, we'll later on go more into the idea of ethnicity and the complexities of it. Uh, in some ways, this section and my, uh, my, uh, my picture uh, from, from Kathleen Hall's uh, work uh, jumps, the, jumps the starting gun a little bit on how we're going to talk more in the boundaries chapter about ethnicity. But I want to uh, put it out here because uh, it appears here briefly because it relates to our idea, what Barth was talking about is that it relates to our idea we were talking about of heterogeneity, that in any society, there's going to be a large number of different ideas. And uh, it's sometimes difficult to say, well, hey, this is their cultural idea because there's going to be variation within any society. And then it also, it relates, and this is where Barth's work comes in, is the idea of identity on boundaries and borders. And so what Barth discovered is that you could say that the two different groups, for example, you could say, oh, wow, they, they are so different, but they might say among themselves that they're completely the same. Whereas people that looked from the outside to be almost completely the same would say how different they were from their neighbors. And so this often happens and again, we'll talk about this later with, with what we call ethnic conflicts, where there are two groups of people who objectively from the outside look like they should be the most same in the world. Uh, they're most more like each other than they are like any other group in the world. And yet they will be fighting with each other and claiming that they are so different from each other. So it's something we, I think we talked about at the beginning of class that the whole notion of difference is of course something that we, uh, we do subjectively. So there's no sort of objective measure of difference because people are always making differences or proliferating differences out of what we might consider sameness or taking people who are different and, and, and sort of borrowing from them. Now, again, we'll talk more about this later, but I wanted to bring it up here because it relates to a number of points we were making in the last class about the relational process that goes on uh, with 
uh, with ethnicity and culture. And the problem of simply believing that everyone uh, is encased in their own cultural group or their own identity. Now, the idea that everyone had an ethnic identity what has been further amplified in the last two or 300 years by the idea that everyone then belongs to a nation. And uh, this is on page 231 in the section called Place and Space, where they bring up the work of Benedict Anderson and the idea of imagined community. Now, we first have to realize that, of course, it's very deep in our lives. Well, Sean, what do we do? What do we do as human beings? What are we always waving around and, and rallying around? Flag. Our flag, right? What is a flag? A symbol. A symbol. Symbol for what? Like unity. Like, like, something for everyone to gather. Yeah, so we, I mean, it's a basic notion of humanity, right? That we, we think through symbols, we think through words, we think through things that mean other things. And we take things like white flags and blue flags and red hats, and we wave them around, and then that confers upon an identity upon it. So this is a human thing to do, we're always doing it, but it's not necessarily that that is going to equal, I belong to a nation. The idea that a symbol like a flag represented a nation and that everyone should belong to one is actually a relatively recent idea. By relatively recent, I mean in the last two or 300 years. And so Benedict Anderson's work was about how this idea that, that you are in some ways related to or have something in common with people that you've never seen in your life, that live in a faraway place, but somehow you share something called a nation. So we see this get gelled up in places like symbols, uh, like Sean has told us about flags and things to rally behind. Uh, Lexi, where else does this happen? Yeah, and also where, where, where do we see people get really riled up about their country? The Olympics, right? All of a sudden we're cheering on people, you know, we're never gonna see, oh, well, hopefully we will, we'll see some of them. But, you know, we feel this camaraderie or the spirit with people that, you know, we've never seen before. And so Anderson's idea was, that this is not a physical place community, it's the imagined community that you have with people who are far away. And people do crazy things on behalf of a nation, which they never used to do before, right? So I sometimes ask people, uh, maybe I shouldn't ask people, what would you kill for? What would you die for and what would you kill for, right? And so, you know, perhaps in the old days we would say, well, your family, but the idea that you would do this for a nation, that you would do this for a country, is actually a relatively, it would seem absurd three or 400 years ago that you would die for a nation. I was reading about, uh, so there's a couple, it's a really strange story about those two people who were selling nuclear submarine secrets to a foreign country, they're being tried. So we have, to, but what struck me about this is we apparently have these nuclear submarines and the whole goal of these things is to stay submerged as long as possible for like years. So that the submarine is submerged for like 20 or 30 years. So nobody knows where it is. And then when it comes up, it's like, aha, gotcha. I'm starting to try to think about this though. How do you convince somebody that you need to go spend 30 years of your life submerged on a submarine, right? What would you... <sighs> Does anybody want to do that? <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm just trying to imagine why, how powerful it must be 
to believe that what you should do is go into a submarine and stay there for years, maybe even a year for me would be a lot, right? And the idea is you're doing this for your nation or your country. So we've had this, as Anderson said, this spread of the idea that everybody must belong, identify with a nation or a country. And so we divide up the world. Now I was thinking about this in terms of what, uh, in your textbook, we talked about this idea of the global north. Um, and so I looked up on Wikipedia, what, what is the global north? And so the global north refers to all the countries that are there in blue. Whereas the global south are all the countries that are in red. Now you'll see one immediate problem with the idea of the global north. <laughs> Some countries have nothing in common. Yeah, it's, um, it's a pretty weird map, right? What else is going on? If I said, hey, I'm in the global north. <laughs> That's what you're going to see. Uh, Australia and, New, and uh, New Zealand down there are not in the north. And in fact, most of the countries that are, if you see that equator line going through there, many of the countries that are said to be in the global south are actually in the north. So it's a strange thing. What might we have called these countries before? Yeah. Okay, so yes, the global south has sort of displaced the idea of the, for the countries in red, what we used to call the third world countries, um, which uh, has its own, has its own interesting history because in fact, most people think of the third world and we think of, you know, all the bad things. Um, the first world, of course, was supposed to be the, the capitalist world. The second world was supposed to be the communist world. When originally conceived, uh, there was a conference uh, in Indonesia, and the third world was supposed to be this light of beacon and hope against the first and the second world. And so it was conceived of this very positive thing. Um, you know, I guess I would say... Uh, Brazil, for example, is, is one of the top 10 economies in the world. Argentina is part of the G20. You know, I mean, to say, to say that, 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 these are, uh, that these are third world countries. So, you know, I mean, we also have used the word, words industrializing or developing, which are also weird. Any other words that we know of? Global North is also, as we talked about in the last class, might be considered to be what we used to call the Western world. Again, difficult because where, where do we draw the lines of who is, who is in the West? And so what I'm trying to get at here is, again, this idea is the world is divided up into places that each person belongs to a country and that country identification is what makes you uh, what what places you within the global uh, the global hierarchy? And so I want to propose a slightly different idea to you, which is uh, which is from uh, Michel Rolf Trouillot, as I've mentioned before, uh, but he's borrowing it from an author from Mart Martinique in the Caribbean, who wrote that the West is not in the West; it is a project, not a place. And so what Trio and I think Glissant are trying to say here is that what we need to be looking for are not physical places, although those are always important and we should think about them, but the processes that make people, uh, that make this happen as an identity. And this relates to what we were talking about in the last class in terms of where did these ideas about identity and who belongs where emerge? How do they change? What things might have been possible? Uh, what are the alternatives to the history that we lived? So 
the idea of being of identity being a or, or the West being a project or a process, not necessarily a fixed place, is related to what I most, most, most want to say about identity, which is that identity is not simply something that gets that is fixed for all time. Identity is a process that people are always working on and redefining, and it's relational in the sense that we have identities in relationship to other people. And so it goes back to the, the, uh, the idea from Barth about that identity uh, is based on contrast. And so that's why it often is most marked on places that we mark off as boundaries or borders. Because if you have nothing to contrast your identity against, then, then what's your identity? So. Of course, a lot of people do believe that identity is this fixed thing, that you're born with it, that it's biological, that you can't change it. And so I think it's helpful to us anthropologically, analytically, to see it as something that's in process. And also to be aware of what I'm calling heterogeneity, history, interconnection, and power as always important in understanding uh, who gets to have what identity. So this is helpful to us to see. And to some people, this may actually be kind of liberating for yourself to realize that, wait a second, uh, you know, this whole fixation, I think, I think Lexi, you put it, why do we, why does everybody always have to have an identity? The whole fixation on it, we might liberate ourselves a little bit from the idea of having to find a fixed identity. But we should also understand why people get upset if we start talking about identity as a process or as a um, as something that is relational, so let's turn into a few a few parts of this chapter on identity. Team, are you like this idea of uh, place and starting to go with the flow or something like that? Why? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right. So in some ways you have understood how this works as a process and you start to pick up things from people around you. In some cases, though, you gave us an example of the the Rohingya, the Rohingya, right? What happened to them? What's going on there? Right. So, uh, yeah, this was a, a study by Sultana uh, Ishrat Zakia Sultana uh, talking about the Rohingya situation. Um, and I guess I bring that up because, in fact, you know, this whole idea that everyone has to have a nation or an imagined community has, in many ways, been. Uh, the, the reality on the ground is that a lot of people have been displaced from their place or never had a community, and it's very complicated. Now, some people, for some people, this creates a, a huge problem. For others, they don't seem to be uh, quite as wedded to that idea of being in a particular place. But it's always, again, this issue of you know, how, who gets to imagine a community? Where are the boundaries? of that community and what happens when that community is displaced or disrupted. So uh, some interesting stuff there on the uh, on two, page 232 to through 233 on the on situations where your imagined community gets uh, in some ways displaced. Music. What if you want to talk about music? Let's see. Uh, Annie, tell us about music. Yeah, very powerful music in terms of 
of your identity. And Aaron, you're talking about indigenous peoples and music, is that true? Way to connect to certain circles, and that is a way to connect to certain circles. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess that can happen, right? Where you form an indigenous identity, and it has to do with music and ancestry and those kinds of things. Interestingly though, the next example in the book, these guys, the Teriyaki Boys, a well-known Japanese hip hop group who have collaborated with American rap artists such as Kanye West, Pharrell Williams, and Jay-Z. <laughs> Matt, you're shaking your head, why? So we have this group from Japan, and this is not the only group. We have it's a huge, a huge hip hop scene in Japan, which is of course Western, but of a particular part of the West, right? It, 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 you know, it, they're drawing upon what they consider to be the African American or the Black experience in the United States. They're often saying that they are in some ways parallel to that in their own society, although not always. Sometimes it's a, I guess some people might get nervous about this and say, what might we say they're doing? Or might we be kind of worried that this is a cultural appropriation of things that, you know, I guess in some cases we've come up against the idea that people take identities from other people and then resell them or redo them um, in some ways. So, I mean, it's, I guess what I'm, what, what I'm trying to get at here is music seems to be this very powerful, as Annie and Aaron said, it's very powerful identification with a group, but it's also complicated because for one thing, music is, is a, personal expression, right? And how much is that based upon your identification with a certain group? And I think both Annie and Aaron asked about the idea of, well, is it, you know, how much does your culture, your groups shape your music identification? And how might your identification with music shape the very group that you're in? Um, which is, again, a complicated question. I had a couple of, uh, so let me ask you a couple, a couple things about music. So in the old days, when I drive around say rural upstate New York, or when I used to live in upstate Michigan, I don't know if they still have these radio stations, but their taglines went something like this. All the hits of today's music, but no rap. So, when you say that you're gonna play all the hits, but no rap, what is your identity as a music station? What are you saying? All the hits, but no rap, Aaron. The rap well, yes, the rap isn't a hit. I think I would be, uh, I'd, I'd probably go a step further. What are you trying to say about what your music is? Yeah, Matt. <laughs> yeah it's it's a pretty much saying you know we'll play all the hits as long as they're white people 
music, right? I mean, to be overly blunt about it, right? So there's that kind of thing going on. And then, I don't know, when you drive through, if you, do people blast music anymore? Is that still a thing? All right, so when you're driving through Oneonta, what is, what is the music blasting out these days? I haven't asked this question in a while. I think I'll just ask it. What are you likely to hear? Ah, still? To this day. Okay, so it's stayed. Yes, I once asked if you took somebody from a different country, and let's say they were, you asked them to close their eyes and you drove through Oneonta and you asked them to just listen to the music that's blasting out wherever you drove around. And then you said, all right, who lives here? What would they think about the racial makeup of who lived in Oneonta, right? I mean, I think that they probably think it's quite different than what we actually see when we drive around. And so again, you know, this idea of where, where we get stuff from. Somebody's not here who mentioned K-pop and how popular K-pop is today. I don't know if it's very blastable from, from speakers. Um, but, you know, this was a, a, a very deliberate strategy actually by the, uh, by the South Korean government to fund and insert itself into the cultural identification. Um, and so we have a, again, something that, that seems so basic, yet is quite in process and quite uh, changeable. Similarly with language. So a lot of you wanted to talk about language and the power of language. Haley, what makes language so so powerful, or okay. So as we saw again, and and I think uh, you said you wrote it in your essay on it. Is it is you know language is sort of fundamental to being human fundamental to how we become human. We all become human in a particular set of languages or language and, we, and it influences the way we think and it influences our identity. And so on the one hand, language seems incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful and incredibly stable. But then Michelle, we read about here, what do we read about in terms of language? What else do people do with language? Yeah, and we sometimes are doing something where we do, you want to know about this, code switching. So sometimes this happens when people speak two different languages, one at home and one in public. Sometimes this happens when people are able to switch languages in mid-sentence, and all of a sudden they're, you know, speaking Spanish in the middle of an English sentence, and oh, there's some wonderful, wonderful uh, rap songs that do that, uh, that, uh, that can kind of slide between both languages. Um, sometimes code switching can simply refer to we, when we speak with our friends or over text in a very informal register, but then can uh, change to a formal register when we speak with our, our parents or with our professors. Uh, code switching can also refer to different gender styles of speaking in different languages. But the point again here is that language, although it seems fixed and unchangeable, oftentimes we are switching between different ways of using language. And again, it relates to something that we talked about uh, in the last class, or no, a long time ago, uh, when we were talking about language, which is, you know, who defines what even is a language? There was a very famous uh, quip that I gave you from uh, Max Weinreich that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy, which is to say that the very definition of language depends upon power and who's using it. 
Actually, Willa, you had an example of that or something like, something kind of like this, where you have different language stuff related to power. Yeah, so very good examples. Uh, we talked about how, again, who gets to impose the idea of what is a proper language, what counts as a language. Uh, several of you talked about uh, the, uh, the, the hierarchical nature of language in which certain languages are privileged, for example, in Zambia, where they're hierarchically organized. Um, and I've talked about how uh, we have this idea that again comes to us from the idea of the imagined community of the nation that each country has its own one language, which may not be a natural human condition. We may actually be multilingual, but we've, we've acquired this idea that each nation has to speak its own language. And Willa wanted to know if I had any other examples or maybe somebody else in the class has an example. And I do have at least one. There's actually lots of examples about languages, but mine comes from my own, uh, my grandparents uh, who grew up in this sort of the, the Northwestern, the extreme Northwestern section of uh, what is now Italy. And uh, my grandparents never said that they spoke Italian. They always said that they spoke dialect. And uh, it was uh, a, what they meant was it was whatever was going on in their, in their village or town at the time. And my great grandfather, he would walk across every summer, walk across into France, across the border uh, and got a summer, a summer job there uh, with, with um, cutting hay. Uh, and what he found was that even though he was on the French side of the border, he could understand the people in that town just as well. And that they were speaking basically the same dialect that he was speaking on the Italian side of the border. So what was going on here? In part, what was going on is that there was uh, what uh, the linguists call a linguistic chain in which people from different towns have very similar dialects or languages, but if you got them together from one end of the chain to the other, they couldn't understand each other. So you have this kind of gradual change. But the other thing that happens is that the language that we would call, that we now call Italian, is actually the dialect of a particular area of Italy, which was taken up as, okay, this is the real way to speak Italian, and that's what we're going to speak in uh, teach in school. And we're not gonna let people speak this dialect thing anymore. And the same thing happened in France. 
where there was a particular dialect around the Parisian region, which then got imposed upon the rest of the country as the country went through this idea that we needed to make people into citizens. And so I often use this quote because it's, it's, it's a really interesting idea of how people make this imagined community. First of all, look at the year 1861, not very long ago, really. And what this person Massimo D'Aselio was saying is that, you know, he was very into Italian unification. He was, a, he was a politician. And basically he had to take all these little groups, all these warring regions and turn them into a country. And so his first, you know, their first objective, he said, we have made Italy. And what he meant by that is we have made a nation state. We have made a state government apparatus. Now we must make Italians. So his idea was these, you know, the people that we have under this control, they need to now think of themselves as Italians. So we're going to make them speak a certain language in school. They can't speak that thing called dialect. They have to speak this other thing called Italian. And if they speak dialect in school, we're going to hit them and say they're stupid. Right. And so, you know, in some ways it says uh, my grandparents lived and died not believing that what they spoke wasn't even a language. It was only later that I found that, oh yeah, there's a really actually an interesting literature in this, in this uh, language that they call dialect. So in school, we're gonna impose Italian, we're going to give you a sense of history, we're going to make you join the army, and we're gonna mix up the people from Southern Italy with the people from Northern Italy and give you this sense of national identity. So uh, there's a lot of different ways in which uh, people are asked to participate in a national identity. Now this leads to the idea that in some ways, a lot of the things that we think of as traditions or ideas about identity actually become invented quite recently. And so uh, uh, there's an edited book by Eric Hosbaugh and Terence Ranger called The Invention of Tradition. And what they're talking about is that a lot of things that we think of as very ancient and very ancestral are actually quite recently in the last two or three generations invented. Um, and it goes with the idea that identity is a process. It's something that is relational. And because human memory is fairly short, doesn't go back very long. And because ritual action is so powerful, these things get very embedded in our minds. Now, what Hobsbawm and Ranger were, were trying to talk against was this idea that you know, every ethnicity deserved its own nation. Uh, what we see today is the rise of ethno-nationalism. But things get complicated, I guess, when we talk about, uh, when we talk about these issues with other peoples. So Gabe, you had a good question about this. If we know that identity is in process and things are, are invented, what happens when we talk to people? What kind of people might also be, get upset about this invention of tradition idea? Uh, indigenous people. Why? Because uh, a lot of indigenous people believe in like Turtle Island, like we've always been here. So I asked, like, how do we anthropologists like talk about like the people in New America like, with an indigenous person? Yeah, things get a little complicated. And to be honest, some anthropologists have just been assholes about it, right? They've just been like, aha, your tradition was all invented, you indigenous people. So we're going to go take those bones and do something with them. I don't think everybody, but you know, we just want to bring that out. In fact, I just read an article uh, in, uh, in uh, the anthropological blog, Sapiens. It's called Land Acknowledgements Are Not Enough. And uh, for, especially for those of you who went to uh, uh, the speaker in, in Jaeger Museum um, about you know, the idea of uh, doing a land acknowledgement, uh, 
And what these anthropologists are saying is that, yeah, that's good. We want to acknowledge that land, but we also need to kind of go further in that and to understand the process by which land was taken away. But again here, what I think this goes back to uh, is something that we talked about in the last class that, um, that understanding cultural relativism and the process of these things is a good first step. And what it makes you ready to do is to negotiate some of the complex issues that are out there. And so when people, you, it helps you understand that yes, sometimes it might be necessary to think of identity as relational and processual because it can be a liberating thing and you may want might want to talk back against certain forms of ethno-nationalism. But in other cases, you have to realize that sometimes these are used as weapons against people to try and further displace them or try and say that their problems don't matter or that everybody is a refugee or some other bullshit, which is to say that sometimes you have to be very careful about negotiating this when you're dealing with people who have been on the oppressed side or the displaced side of of capitalism and, and these ideas. So I guess, Gabe, I would say that, yeah, it's complicated and you wanna realize, hey, you know, these, these beliefs are hugely important. It's not going to, you know, we can, and, and they're important to people who are trying to make certain, uh, who are trying to, to, to act in the world in a way in which in, to uh, reclaim what has uh, been theirs uh, from the beginning. 